first of all, we just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, we're super excited to share our story with, with you all. Um, so thanks for taking the time. Um, what we want to talk about today is um, just sort of a history of night shift brewing through the lens of what we um, have just called Create Better. Um, we've sort of refined what uh, our company stands for uh, to the point of calling this uh, or calling it Create Better, which has led us to um, sort of consistently improve our business. Um, it's kind of about learning from our failures, and we're just kind of hoping to walk through our history um, with that lens in mind and just kind of talk through our story. So a little bit about who we are. Um, we are the three founders of Night Shift Brewing. Uh, I'm Michael. This is Mike. That's Rob. Um, we collectively own about 80% of the company. So we, uh, we're the board of directors. We make the decisions. Uh, we set the vision for it. Uh, and we, we started it. So uh, we're actively involved day to day. Um, and we're also driving sort of long-term vision. Um, I just want to note Rob's also the president of the Mass Brewers Guild, which um, has been really impactful, not just for our business, but also for uh, business and breweries in Massachusetts. So that's been super exciting. So first, I want to talk about uh, failure, uh, because our past is full of it. And I think it's important context to set. This is me, I think, just transferring some beer back in 2013 and totally failing at it. Um, so I, I think what's important to note is you know, our failures are often um, some of the reasons we've been successful, because we've had to learn from them. Um, and it's sort of kind of forced us to make creative mistakes. So I just wanted to walk through a few of them um, and just kind of uh, re recap some of the things that we've screwed up over the years that have taught us um, some serious lessons. First off, we just didn't have any professional experience. We made a lot of mistakes because we weren't in the industry uh, beforehand. We were just home brewers. Um, I, I do think having that uh, perspective kind of gave us this fresh set of eyes uh, on the industry. And sometimes I think we made more creative decisions. but also a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, at, at times, especially in the early years, uh, the quality of our beer was um, sometimes iffy. Uh, it was good enough, definitely, to get us where we are. But um, you know, we did have corks that would pop out of bottles, um, bottles that would gush. Um, there's a video on YouTube of a guy opening a bottle of our beer, and it like explodes everywhere, um, which we play at staff parties. Um, <laughs> And we've drained a lot of beer. Uh, we won't put out beer that's no good, or that's good, or that's no good. Um, and it's it's forced us to develop a much better lab, better equipment. Uh, we learned a lot through um, you know initially having some iffy beer. Um, inventory and freshness issues were uh, definitely things we we have struggled with, uh, or at least struggled with in the past. Um, as you grow, you know you have more and more beer, and you have to figure out how to store it um, and how to keep track of it. Um, so we've had to learn ways to sort of um, deal with that and develop cold storage and uh, better processes for managing all of our beer. Um, especially early, we barely made payroll uh, a lot, and it was really scary. Um, but that forced us to create uh, you know, more fiscally responsible approaches uh, to our budget uh, and have a better control of our balance sheet. Um, when we started, it was just the three of us. And we didn't really have a staff development plan because we weren't worried about developing anyone other than ourselves. Um, we're now at 126 people. And that has you know, forced us to uh, think about you know, how, how we're developing people and their futures, not just our own. Um, and we most recently hired an HR director, which was super exciting. Um, and then just finally, you know, underplanned over budget and abandoned projects. You know, we got plenty of those behind us. Um, but I, I think what's important to note there is, you know, we just learned to ask better questions to, to put better projects in front of us. Um, all right, so while we hope you're going to listen to us anyway, um, we're a passion-driven business. Uh, we started with a really strong passion, and I think we still have that today. Um, it's what drives us to, you know, wake up every day and do what we do. Um, we're still very independent. You know, we own collectively 80% of the company. The rest is friends and family. Um, we've been profitable every year since we started. Uh, 150 times volume growth since the very beginning. Um, I, I, you know, it's been amazing to see, and we, we don't even think about it very often. We just kind of keep going, but um, we do we sort of do have that behind us, and it's been awesome. Um, like I said, we employ 126 people. And we try and offer them great perks. Um, we started with this approach of you know going deep, not wide, and we we still have maintained that um, in our market. Uh, we were just in Massachusetts when we started, and we're mostly still in Massachusetts today, uh, just a little bit out of state. Uh, we still have strong sales and velocity, and 
Um, as we're going to talk about today, we're on a mission to shift our industry and create better. So a little uh, visual history of Night Shift through the lens of Create Better. Um, five years of homebrewing behind us. We started in 2012. Uh, we had 150 capital raised between friends and family, three staff, 1,500 square feet in Everett, um, in this small, dingy little construction space um, that we turned into a brewery. And uh, lots of passion, lots more ignorance. Um, this photo was taken at 4.36 AM at the end of a really long brew day. That was our first day ever brewing. Um, so it's just like one of those moments we've captured. First day brewing commercially. First day brewing commercially, yes, true. And here's a day uh, brewing um, as home brewers. So this is in our Somerville kitchen. Um, three of us just standing there looking like Muppets. and. Um, then we turned pro, and that shot was taken uh, for the improper Bostonian uh, in 2012. Um, this is our brewery uh, back in 2012. This is like a clean day for us. Um, yeah. So I just want to talk through a few of the, uh, the things that we focused on uh, to sort of create better when we were beginning. And then I'll hand it off to these guys to walk us through the rest of the years. We started with all cork and cage bottles. Uh, we hand labeled them. We hand wrote on them. We were really going for like a very premium look. Um, we were trying to stand out in the marketplace, um, elevate beer to sort of like a wine-like status. Uh, it gave us higher margins. And um, I think it did help us stand out. Um, and it, you know, a personal touch, like writing on every single label, um, it was a huge pain. But like people, I think appreciated it. Um, and eventually, we moved away from that into cans, which we'll get to uh, fairly soon. Uh, but it, it was an interesting way to start because it was this create better mentality. Um, I also just want to note we started with volunteers. Uh, some of those guys in the picture there were just volunteers helping us. Um, None of them we employ anymore, but we did hire a bunch of our volunteers from the beginning. Uh, and that's just been like super rewarding to be able to take people that were volunteering and just lending their time to us and bring them on and uh, sort of help grow the company with them together. So the other, I would say, like big thing that helped us stand out in the beginning was 100% shifted beers. It was like nothing can go in a bottle unless it's shifted. Um, we even said, like, we will never brew an IPA. That's a thing. Um, <laughs> which is so weird because now like our focus is really like hoppy beers. Um, but in the beginning, it was all shifted. Uh, Viva Habanero was uh, the rye ale with habanero peppers. That was sort of one of our trademark flagship uh, core beers in the beginning. Um, it got us attention. It really established us as an innovation brand. Um, ultimately, it was unsuccessful uh, just because we decided to switch to more drinkable beers uh, Hoppy, hoppy beers uh, that encourage more repeat purchases. Um, genius. It was genius. <laughs> it was brilliant. But it was a great way to get our name out there uh, and spread the word. The sour barrel aging program that we started with um, is still alive to this day. Um, it is sort of an extension of our shifted approach. Um, I mean, we still produce Everweiss. Shifted is basically uh, no traditional, not, not just traditional ingredients of water, malts, hops, and yeast. So um, just anything else that we could think of, like cinnamon sticks, fruit, habanero peppers, uh, we got weirder than that. But yeah, you know, Everweiss is a beer that actually stuck around. We started with it, um, and that one's grown into sort of a core offering of ours. Um, and I, I think you know, trying to do barrel-aged sour beers, again, forced us to sort of learn about interesting processes that are really complex. And we made a ton of mistakes uh, along the way. And now we can you know, put out this, this awesome sour program. Um, that's grown with us. Uh, we started with plastic fermenters. Um, it was not a good idea uh, looking back, but it was cheap and we didn't have a lot of money. So um, it's so like shameful to say, but we had like a, like a normal ale room, which was just co conditioned with an air conditioner and then like a sour Saison room, which was just a space heater. Um, and that's how we like controlled temperature. Um, which is just not recommended at all. But we made it work, uh, and you know the, the beer quality was good enough to uh, get us out there. Uh, we did ultimately make the decision to move to stainless steel uh, when we could afford it, um, and you know that, that allowed us to really expand our style offerings. It actually allowed us to really get into hoppy beers, uh, improve our quality a lot, uh, and set the direction for the future of the company. One of the core decisions I think we made in the beginning was to not sign with a distributor um, and just do it all ourselves. 
Uh, we'll get to it a lot more later. But uh, at the time, you know, we were just looking at the distributor partners out there. We didn't see um, anyone that we wanted to work with. And uh, mass franchise law basically locks you uh, in a contract for life. So we didn't want to do that. And so we uh, said, we'll just throw a beer in a Subaru, drop it off, and uh, handle all the sales ourselves. Um, it allowed us to keep 30% margin, which is which was good for profitability. But um, probably more importantly, it allowed us to develop really deep relationships with all of our accounts um, and get to know what our customers' needs were and like hear on a regular basis um, you know, what's happening in the market. Uh, our tasting room was not a part of the business plan, really. Um, and it's become you know, core to who we are today. Um, we started with 90 square feet. Uh, we thought, you know, some people will drop in here, probably not all, very often because we're in a sketchy warehouse. Um, but if they want to come in, cool, and uh, we'll sample them on some beers. Um, as our reputation grew, we uh, just got busier and busier. We expanded our hours. I think we were just, um, was it Thursdays and Saturdays to start? And it, you know, open every day of the week was soon a thing. Um, we expanded into our production space, which was like dangerous and not a good idea, but. When you have people like waiting out the door, what are you going to do? Um, and then uh, we ultimately learned, like, okay, when we move, which we know we have to do, we have to build a bigger tap room because uh, this is you know, more important um, than a 90 square foot space. And then the, the last thing I want to talk about is just uh, the decision to put the owl everywhere. Um, I, I actually drew our logo back in 2010 when we were just homebrewing, and it was just something to slap on bottles uh, as like our homebrew labels and give it to friends. Um, and when we made the business, it was just like, oh, this is our logo, cool. We decided to be a logo-oriented company. Um, not a lot of breweries were doing that, and we decided like that's going to be what's everywhere. Um, it's a hop and an owl at the same time, and it's kind of a nocturnal creature, so it felt like it made sense. Um, and we've really we've grown with that, and we've just made that a bigger and bigger part of our branding. And I think that's um, been a huge part of sort of how we've grown and. Uh, created messaging around uh, our logo in the owl. Transitioning from our early, early, early years in 2012, 2013 to 2014 and 15, I'll pass it over to Mike. So the next couple of years um, was a kind of a big transition for us. Um, we moved to a new brewery, as you know, Michael alluded to. We went from 700 barrels in 2013 to over 4,000 barrels by the end of uh, 2015 kind of had a renewed focus on quality, evolved our branding, and you know, went through a few expansion projects along the way that you know, themselves had a couple rough patches that we learned from. Um, and then <clears throat> you know, really continued to establish our, our strong local presence um, and following. In 2014, you know, we expanded our tap room. That was a new thing. It wasn't in our business plan to begin with. Um, we kind of threw that business plan out. And like, OK, we're focusing on the tap room. It's going to be an awesome place for people to come and hang out instead of coming to a dingy, creepy warehouse that didn't have true working bathrooms. Um, so this was a very nice upgrade, um, real bathrooms included. Um, just kind of a side by side, our original brewery, which is about 60 gallons uh, per kettle there, um, to our new brewery, which required steps to get up to, and about 600 barrels per batch. Um, so a pretty sizable increase in production size there. And then, you know, here's a couple uh, picture of our lab. So, you know, we also invested a lot in quality because, you know, if we're dumping beer that isn't good enough to go out to the market, um, which is good for our reputation, um, but bad for our bottom line. So we had to do something about that in order to continue uh, making world-class beer. We invested heavily in our lab and equipment and people to run it um, to make sure that you know everything from you know the day we're brewing it to the time we're pack packaging it is you know analyzed along the line and made sure it's quality and we're gonna be able to ship what we make um, and be really proud of it at the same time so increasing the quality and consistent th consistency there was was pretty key in addition to that you know transitioning to cans um, it's kind of two parts there one was you know cans are better for the beer. They don't let light in. Um, they don't let as much oxygen in. Uh, so it increases the shelf stability. So that increases the quality of, of the beer just, just in the package format change. We kind of saw early on that the craft beer market was shifting away from bottles, uh, which goes totally against what we were trying to do with the cork and cage. But um, that's what 
people started to buy, and we latched onto that very early on. Um, and you know, as soon as we did, we noticed velocity increase it increased um, tremendously. Uh, and we think a big part of that was, you know, it's kind of hard to sit down for a night and commit to 25 ounces of, you know, a 7% beer, where it's much easier to snap a can off of a four pack and, you know, drink 16 ounces of it. And then maybe drink the rest of the four pack if you want. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you have options. And then along with the cans, uh, it was an opportunity to kind of, you know, re-envision the branding. Um, and originally, with our logo, we kind of had the Owl and Night Shift Brewing all kind of squished together with a box. Um, and this offered an opportunity for us to revisit that and really focus on the Owl. The Owl was going to be everywhere to begin with. So like, why not just make that the prominent thing on the can? That, the Owl is pretty cool and recognizable. So we did that. And we started with the Whirlpool can with, you know, just the silver can, which looks pretty cool. And the Morph can. And then you can see it evolved into a more playful thing with Santilli and Whirlpool. And along with that, we shifted away from doing our shifted beers with weird ingredients only and our uh, no IPA philosophy to doing IPAs and pale ales. And Santilli Whirlpool have become our two best-selling beers. So we're not afraid to like change our mindset and get stuck in our ways, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> and a really awesome example of our IPA uh, evolution is Morph. Um, it was kind of born out of necessity. Uh, we weren't very good at hop, contract, hop contracting or forecasting what we were going to sell in the future. Um, so we kind of took what we got. And Morph was a way to do that. And we had a consistent brand. But each batch was different from, each, from itself. So we saw an opportunity in that. It's like, well, we can kind of use this as a test market because we didn't have a flagship IPA at the time. And we would analyze sales data in the tap room and collect feedback directly from customers in the tap room. And you know, we used that to uh, turn Morph into our flagship IPA, which is Santilli. So we kind of secretly crowdsourced our flagship IPA. Um, and then in 2016, we entered that into the World Beer Cup, and it ended up winning bronze, which is pretty awesome validation um, for that process there. Continuing the evolution towards quality and, and making things happen, we go from a keg <laughs> seat belted into the back of a Subaru. That's my Subaru that I still drive. I drove it here today. Yeah. <laughs> it smells like beer. It, yeah, it constantly smells like beer. It's not, never going away. We upgraded to a Sprinter van, um, you know, which helped us increase the amount of beer we could drop per, per account, which you know, increased efficiency. Um, and then you know, finally, now we have a fleet of, well, we still kind of have a fleet of Subarus floating around, but we don't deliver beer anymore. Anymore. Now we have a fleet of refrigerated box trucks, so everything is cold from the time we package it to the time we deliver it and put it on the shelf. Um, <clears throat> you know, just kind of focusing on efficiencies and qualities and making sure the beer is the best it can be. And then 2016, 2017, you know, new equipment. Of course, brewery expansions happening, uh, taproom expansions, and and continuing to add people. Um, here <clears throat> we've got our taproom expansion. So this is a, a new room and ended up making this really cool event space um, with the tap room and what we call the annex, um, which ended up being like an event space for us. Uh, continued to add new equipment, new canning line, our own canning line. We were using a mobile canner. Uh, again, we could focus and do our own quality control on that canning line and not have to rely on somebody else. More capacity with bigger tanks, more efficiencies with more equipment outside, grain silos. We could order by the truckload instead of by the pallet. Um, and you know it's always awesome to get validation. You know, we always thought we had it. <clears throat> um, we always thought we had great culture. We had quality beer, great beer. People liked it. Um, but to enter these contests and win awards and look at our Yelp reviews, it's it's always good to see that. And Google reviews. Yeah, <clears throat> the best one. Of the <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, it's, it's always good to have that kind of like different perspective and outside in um, validation of that, OK, yeah, maybe, maybe we are doing something right. Um, that feels good. Let's continue to try, to try to do something cool. And along the way, we've had to hire more people. So you know, we had about 65 employees at the end of 2017. I think we mentioned we have 126 now. Um, and we, you know, we've had to we've had struggles, but we've gotten smarter about how we keep the culture gotten smart about how we hire people. We invested in a program that you know, helps us uh, you know, looking at people's personalities to make sure that the right fit, get the right people in the right role, uh, right people in the right seat of the bus, uh, so to speak. So 
Yeah, we've gotten we've gotten smarter at at hiring people over over the years, and continue to add great people to the team and and keep them around with what we provide them with culture and benefits and whatnot. During that time, we also started a distributorship. So I'm going to let Rob take that away. Sure. So in uh, October 2016, we launched our own distribution company. We were, we were running out of space in Everett, and, and we needed a new warehouse. And we've been doing it for ourselves. We thought we were kind of good at it. So um, we were hearing from a lot of other breweries that they were frustrated with the same options that we were faced at one point. And a key tenant to our distribution company was, even though franchise law exists in the state today, that we wouldn't hold um, fellow like-minded brewers to that. If, if things weren't working out, we'll take it uh, professionally and we can part ways and it will be better for both sides of the, part of the, the fence. <laughs> NSD has grown significantly over the last year. Uh, we started the year with, with 600 accounts. We now have 1,600 accounts that we service. We pretty much go from Springfield, uh, East Hampton, Amherst area, all the way out to Martha's Vineyard now. Um, we've really, really added a lot of capabilities to our logistics side of the, our operation. And not only that, when we started the distribution company, we, we were beer guys, so let's only sell beer, um, which we sell 18 different breweries now. We, this year, we also added on wine and spirits, uh, as well as non-alcoholic beverages like cold brew and teas um, and things like that. And we just recently also got our import license. So one of the things we're going to tackle in 2019 is starting importing alcohol from, from Europe starting with some wines from France, um, but all under the same lens of let's look for small, like-minded producers who are doing something a little bit different, who have either innovative packaging or, or cool cool products that are small batch that, that we can really take a hold of and represent well. We set out to sell beer for other people, and we wanted to make sure we were good at it. We didn't want to you know, make a false promise to these other breweries, because they are small people like us that, that put their heart and soul into their businesses. This is a, a presentation from one of our key suppliers to steel. They're a brewery out in Normal, Illinois. Uh, I have visited, it is very normal. Um, they make great sour beers in cans, uh, and we are actually their number one distributor along the East Coast, from from Maine to Florida. We are we are their best su supplier that moved the most volume. This is just a fun little slide that we we put together once, uh, kind of show that we want to be more than just a beer company, that we want to be a beverage company, and at any time of the day, we're selling something that's awesome. Uh, most of these are all local. The first three non ox are all locally owned Massachusetts businesses, which is pretty cool. And then on the brewing side, we continue to in innovate. This uh, beer came to life, we're pointing today as well, uh, came to life kind of back in 2016 when the brewers, after a hot day of brewing, wanted something light and refreshing to drink. And they were drinking like Miller High Life and stuff. And it was like, eventually we were like, what, why the hell are we drinking other people's beer when we have all the equipment to make that beer? Um, and we can probably do it better, so let's do it for ourselves. And that's what we did. Um, and we did it that for a couple times over the like year and a half period. And then we started testing it in the market and people were actually responding to it. So we decided with that combined with the, the feeling that we were getting tired of going out into the market and taking down breweries, IPA draft lines. And those are breweries that we like to hang out with, that we share similar uh, problems with or challenges and successes with. It was like, I love the guys at Jack's Abbey. Why am I taking down their draft line? Let's go after the guys uh, that we don't like. And let's go after the biggest guys. Uh, and we're sort of using the term macro nuisance now. Uh, and it, it's also important to say that the light beer category is the largest category in beer. And it's one that, for whatever reason, craft brewers decided that they didn't want to play in, that that was anti-craft. And so we sort of fenced off the biggest part of the pool and let the biggest people win in it. So why not, why not try to be the smallest guy taking, taking share? We continue to also change our, our, our packaging options. These beers used to be in 750 milliliter champagne bottles. Uh, we talked about these earlier. These are sour beers that are fermented with bacteria. Uh, we got a separate canning line so that we could put the beer live bacteria into the finished go goods. That's something atypical of what a lot of the sour beers that are out there in the market. Those are usually kettle sours, which they kind of cook it to kind of almost pasteurize the product. These are living beers. Um, and we also kind of try to play around with the innovative labeling, and we use really cool photography techniques to kind of showcase, and they look very different from our, our core lineup. This summer, we also opened up two beer gardens along the Esplanade that were, that were a pretty fun place. We have a 
patio in Everett. I don't know if you've ever been, but it is basically you're sitting on crappy asphalt uh, in an industrial park, and it's not very uh, scenic spot. So we set out to find the best spot in Boston to drink, and we worked really hard to get this location. Uh, it was a wild success. One of the cool things that we did here, too, was we could be most profitable if we only sold night shift beer here, but we that wasn't who we are. Uh, we wanted to, we called it the Owl's Nest, and it was a celebration of Night Shift Brewing and our friends. And so we poured a lot of other people's beer here uh, that we made lower margins on, but it was important to us. This is just a fun little slide of kind of our, our barrelage production over the last seven years uh, and kind of showcases our rapid growth. Uh, we started with 200 barrels in our first year. This year, we're, we'll do a little over 30,000. Our business plan had that if we did 10,000 barrels in 10 years, we'd be wildly successful, and we'd, we'd probably call it quits. Uh, now we don't know where, this, where, where the limit is and, and how far we'll go, but I think one important thing is we've always set out to brew to demand, not to hit a number. We're not beholden to a VC or a private equity where we need to hit certain targets. We're brewing um, really slightly behind demand so that we can always have the best product on the shelf um, and we're not chasing anything that's not real. I think you know all this is you know kind of inside feedback on how we thought we were creating better, but I think the, the real proof is will customers recognize that and, and open up their wallets and pay for the product. These numbers are IRI data, which is a syndicated data that's from cash register sales. Uh, this is, these are all from mass liquor stores. Um, one thing that we did to get smarter was actually buy data instead of a uh, guess. So this isn't our internal sales numbers. Uh, this is actually what people are ringing up at cash registers. And it, it's not every single transaction that happens, but it is ind indicative of what is happening out in the world. Um, and we set out to make, once we decided to make hoppy beer, we set out to make the best hoppy beer. And this chart shows that we actually are the number one hoppy beer provider in the state of Massachusetts, which is pretty crazy. That middle column is velocity. That really tells us like if a cus how often does a customer pick our beer over other people's beer? And you can see we're almost at two to one ratio over kind of our next closest peers, which is pretty incredible to see. Our sour can series is classified as a specialty beer. It is the number two specialty beer in the market just behind Budweiser Amber Lager. I don't know who's drinking that crap, but, uh, <laughs> but clearly a lot of people are. Uh, we, we like to showcase here that our velocity is a lot better than theirs. We're in just less stores than Budweiser is in. Uh, I, if we were in more stores, we'd probably be beating them. Nightlight, we set out to be that kind of macro nuisance, and we released it about 26 weeks ago. Uh, so right now we're basically in the top six of light beers which we're, we're pretty shocked to see that we're beating out big multi or global breweries with multi-million dollar advertising campaigns uh, and that we're actually playing somewhat successfully in this market uh, without really any advertising budget uh, at all other than Instagram. So that's been fun that, to take away Mindshare and, and some of these guys are down almost as much as we're up so we're, we like to think we're directly stealing from their pie. If you look at just craft beer across all styles in Massachusetts, we're number three right now, just a few hundred thousand dollars behind Harpoon. But again, we're beating out a bunch of national brewers that have much more resources, that have been around much more longer than us. Um, this is ranked by Velocity again. So in the state, we, we are the second fastest beer. So this, this helps us a lot in our selling story when we go to market. Uh, if a liquor store is just trying to carry us versus, let's say, you know, Dogfish Head um, will sell three times more volume than Dogfish Head will in that same store. And then if you bring in the, the national brewers or the global brewers, again, we are a top 10 brand in the state, which is which pretty incredible. Uh, this is, again, a testament to kind of our deep, not wide velocity of really trying to get our brand in front of Massachusetts consumers and make it just as recognizable as some of these other big beer brands. We really only package our beer in 16 ounce four packs, so another way to slice the data set is to look at, at packaging format. And if you, if you take all beer across all global brewers in the, in the state that play in the liquor stores uh, and look at only 16 ounce four pack sales, we are by far the dominant um, I like to say the king. Uh, we're top point Budweiser pretty heavily here, and, and we're, we're a far market leader compared to our peers in the, in the state, which is really, again, kind of humbling for us to see that this kind of idea from our Somerville kitchen is actually like really taken off. But nonetheless, we're not done yet. Uh, we're, we're setting out to 2019 to try to create even better. We're building a Boston Tap Room on Lovejoy Wharf right next to the garden. We'll have a brewery in there, a kitchen, 
and a coffee bar, which is something, co kitchen and coffee bar are all new for us. It will really be our innovation factory and a lot of our new ideas will be first developed there before scaling up and going out to the wholesale world. Uh, we're again continue even better workplace, adding more benefits, adding more resources, adding more internal training. That's that's super important. We're trying to make ourselves the best place to work. Although I don't know if we can compete with all your amenities, but we'll try. Uh, I think we do have more free beer. Um, <laughs> uh, we're continuing down that macro nuisance line, and we're we're going to launch Limelight this year, which is definitely a direct shot at Bud Light Lime. We think it'll be better. It will use better lime ingredients, and uh, if it's at all as success, successful as Nightlight, we think we'll, we'll have another big winner on our hand. Um, we're continuing to invest in production. We're continuing to add more sour styles. There'll be a fourth one, kind of the mix, uh, Briar, or Bramble Weiss, which will be a blackberry sour with lemon. Uh, and then the next kind of two big questions for us is, is what do we, we sell 90% of our beer in Massachusetts and only uh, beer uh, that we make. Can we grow beyond Massachusetts and replicate what we've done in this state and other states? With the regulatory environment, you kind of have to like reinvent the wheel in every state. They all have different liquor laws, which makes it really confusing and challenging. But can we replicate the brewery and the taproom experience somewhere else? And can we also replicate our wholesale um, operation in other states? And th those are kind of the two big undertakings as we look future. And then the, th the third one is, should we do other beverages and take the same sort of lens of creating better to other beverages? Could we do it for spirits, coffee, wine, cider, kombucha, whatever we're excited and passionate about and, uh, and, and kind of take the, what the lessons we've learned from beer and apply it elsewhere? And I think our final note is just every day we try to create better and I think you guys do the same and, and we appreciate your time. Um, and we can open up to any questions and answers. Let me ask you a timely question. Uh, a certain other brewery in the Boston area is having some very widely publicized labor issues right now. Um, seems like they made some pretty appalling cuts to the wages of some workers and now seem to be like boomeranging way back in the other direction. Maybe this is just two people who made some bad decisions, but it seems like the first time that attention has been drawn to the labor practices of craft brewers. Uh, I'm sure you guys are thinking about this a lot. I'm, I'm wondering what the implications might be um, in terms of, you know, like, wages in the industry, general employment practices. It, how much, is this gonna have any kind of widespread impact or is it just a kind of one shot thing that's gonna die out in a few days? Uh, I mean, I don't wanna speak to the specific situation of the brewery you're referencing to, but the, traditionally the beer industry hasn't been one that's been uh, a, a good place to make a living wage. Uh, we've always set out to try to create a place that people should earn an income. If you ever read through some of my older, I, use, I usually banter on beer advocate uh, forums. Uh, I've, I've justified our higher prices beers around uh, paying our people more uh, and the higher cost of doing business in the Boston metro area. That's important to us. Uh, as the Mass Brewers Guild, we are certainly open to doing some sort of compensation study so that we can all benchmark how we compare to our peers um, and, and, and make sure that everyone understands like kind of where the market is. We obviously can't get into the anti-competitive territory of price fixing wages, but uh, I think there is more that could be done to, to make sure that everyone's compensated correctly. I think the three of us never start this to get rich. That's not our motive. Um, and we've always felt that we should say, share the success with the people who, who create it. Talk a little about packaging. You talked about going from, from uh, seven corked and cage 750s to cans. Why do you end up on the 16 ounce cans? I know it's what everyone is doing, but why 16, not 12? I personally find 16 to be kind of more than I usually want. <laughs> it's definitely something we went back and forth on. I mean, we showed a picture where we first did do 12s, and the kind of initial feedback was that it would be cooler if they were in tall boys. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I would certainly credit a lot of that to the Alchemist and Hetty Topper. I feel like they kind of like paved the way of like, this is where the cool kids go. Uh, but I do agree, we do make Nightlight in 12 ounces, which is our first kind of return back to the 12 ounce. And uh, for the first like 
three or four months, the, the 16 ounces were king, but now the 12 ounces are, are kind of taking over as far as the preferred uh, package type. And it, we're definitely now considering, should we move other beers into either both formats or, or back down to 12? Yeah, how about like the 9% ones in 12 ounces? <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you. That's a little much for me too. <laughs> but um, I will also just want to add, like, it seems that the 16 ounce format um, is somewhat of a New England phenomenon. Um, you know, you go, you venture outside of New England and it is, you know, you still see a lot of 12 ounce bottles. You see a lot of 12 ounce cans. Um, so, and, and one of the other aspects was, okay, we, we use the same amount of, of volume and the same amount of time to fill bigger format. It's, it costs us less in the long run. It's, it's slightly small. Um, but a bunch of those things combined kind of, you know, led us to this, to be like, okay, we need to compete in this market. 16 ounces are a New England phenomenon. Let's, let's at least play around with it. Data wise too, we, we have some of our distro brewery partners that sent us 12 ounce cans and they didn't sell very well. And we asked them, can you put them in 16s and we'll see if it sells better. And some of them did do that for us. And the 16s did sell better, which is, it was just kind of crazy. Um, the, especially ones from out of state where like, well, everyone wants 12 in our market. Why we're not going to make something special for you guys. But when the velocity increased, it was worth it. So with like the craft beer scene growing so much, has that changed, I guess, the way you guys look at what you're doing? Because I'm sure when you started out, it wasn't as big of a, of a fad, but nowadays you see different places popping up all over the place, which is great for the consumer, but I just wonder if it changes the way you look at things at all. And also, do you have any other favorite um, non-night shift beers? <laughs> uh, sure, I'll, I'll start this one. Um, I mean, one of the breweries we consistently look up to is Allagash. Um, they're, you know, that beautiful branding, uh, incredible beer, great leadership, um, really good QA, QC program. Um, they, they seem to sort of check all the boxes in terms of like excellent brewery. Um, and so they've sort of become like a great model and staple for us. Uh, in terms of how we look at the industry, I mean, I think Rob kind of touched upon it earlier, but I, I do think, you know, if you look at like overall industry trends, you know, beer is somewhat flat. Um, we're, we're not, um, and so we definitely feel like we can continue competing and growing and innovating on the, the brewery perspective and, um, you know, it, adding a tap room allows us to connect with consumers, uh, you know, sort of in our space. Um, so doing that in Boston, um, is just sort of building on the, the tap room success that we've had, uh, and sort of diversifying our portfolio between wholesale involvement and sort of on-premise tap room involvement. Um, but looking into other beverages um, is, is something that we consistently or have consistently talked about, but uh, it's starting to become a more and more real conversation uh, as we look at like, what is the future for, you know, not just night shift brewing, but like night shift the family. So when you guys do uh, collaborative uh, beers, uh, how do you decide where the beer is brewed? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I don't know if I know the answer to that, to be honest. Uh, I think it, it usually depends. Sometimes we coordinate around travel, whether it's somebody going on vacation or somebody's coming for like Extreme Beer Fest by Beer Advocate. Hey, um, you know, why don't you come a day earlier and we'll hang out? A lot of those collaborations are, are really a great opportunity for brewers to sh swap like inside, you know, techniques and, and methods and, and processes that is kind of this real secret value behind those uh they're of course really fun and it's fun to kind of mash up the either the styles that breweries are known for or their label art and stuff like that and and we do a fair amount of them but they're definitely not big revenue generators for us i'd also say a lot of the collaborations that we've done uh, have kind of you know gone back and forth um it's kind of like a serial collaboration if you will uh so one time we'll do a collaboration at night shift and then we'll sell that beer you know through our tap room and then the next time We'll travel to that brewery and do a collaboration over there with them, so they get a chance to sell that beer through their tap room and, and things like that. So, um, it's a true collaboration. I wanted to ask about uh, the new flavor process. So, like now that it's not just three of you working on, you know, let's throw this in there and see what happens. You mentioned you have a new blackberry sour coming out. I think What's, how many people are involved with that, or how do you decide on the recipe? How do you kind of push that to market? We used to be involved in every single recipe uh, because it was ours. I mean, I, I think when we launched, like every single one was in a notebook somewhere that we had homebrewed a bunch and we sort of brought it to market and watched it evolve. Um, but, you know, as we've hired a team, I mean, we have people that can make beer that's way better than any of us could. So um, we entrust our people. Uh, we, we definitely have input on sort of like 
where do we want the vision or where do we see the company going from like a vision perspective of like, all right, we want to get more into sour. So like, let's develop those recipes and um, sort of set that direction. But like our team, of our, our production team, uh, which is uh, I actually don't, what's the size in terms of staff? Uh, I think it's like a dozen plus people. Okay. Yeah. So I was going to say like 15 people, they crush it every single day. And so we trust them to, to nail it, execute, innovate. Um, you know, we, we, we sort of have like our wholesale market beers and then we have like our taproom beers. Um, and we've actually kind of blended a little bit over the last year and putting more small batch stuff out into the market. Um, but we see a lot of our innovation happen with those smaller batch releases. We have smaller tanks that like are basically exclusively reserved for that. And then the brewers are basically just given like, you know, free will to just come up with whatever you think is interesting and cool. Uh, put it out, see how it performs, and then you know we scale up appropriately uh, based on success, feedback, all that stuff. Um, it's a, it's a really fun creative process, and again, like our team is trusted to do it, and and we just kind of sit back and go like, awesome, that's the direction, keep going. I'm curious about your new light beer offering. Um, I'm I'm curious why no other craft breweries or very few other craft breweries seem to be going down this road, and I'm also curious like what the different challenges are as far as both. You know, technically brewing and, and marketing this kind of very different offering? So I think that there, there is a couple of reasons. Um, you know, there are a, f a few craft breweries doing it. Um, there are, you know, some of them are the, the bigger craft breweries. And I think part of the reason for that is it's kind of a daunting task because the market is pretty much cornered by like Bud Light, Miller Light. Um, so, you know, they've already kind of got a, a huge head start on that and, and it's hard to kind of break into that. Um, you know, we, we had success and, and got lucky with our branding and, um, you know, it, it's kind of something that people I think were looking for, but I think that's one of the, one of the bigger reasons for that, um, that coupled with, they demand a lower price point. Um, you know, people go out and they buy a light beer that's, you know, 4%. Um, they don't expect to pay 15, $16 for, you know, a four pack. They, uh, they expect to pay a lot less per a 12 ounce, um, 12 pack. Um, so, you know, that that's part of it too, because a lot of other craft breweries, um, including us, and that's one of the reasons why we held off on actually going full force into it for, for a while was because, you know, it, it, it is lower margins. Um, and it's a tougher beer to brew. There's not much other flavor to hide behind if you, if you don't brew it right or don't have great quality control and things like that. So kind of all those things combined, I mean, I can't speak for any other brewery really, but I, I would assume that those are all big reasons for for not for them not really entering that market. And, and I'll just add this data only shows two pack tights. Bud Light is packaged in like so many different class bottles, 18 packs, 24 packs, 30 packs. Uh, that if you look at that number, that's almost nine million here. I think it's in 26 weeks. It's it's something like almost 50 million. So while we're making a dent, we're we're nowhere near the Goliath that is Bud Light. Um, that, that beer is going down. Every year they're selling less and less of it, but uh, it's a big hurdle to attack. It's something like, I think 40% of the beer drank in the state is Bud Light, which is ridiculous. <laughs> I, I just want to add one thing based on your question, right? I think we've almost put it in like our brewery's DNA to um, ask questions like what you just asked, which is like, why isn't anyone doing, like why aren't more people doing that? And like if that question gets asked around the brewery and we can't come up with a good answer, it's just like, okay, go there. Like go in that direction. That's really interesting and at least explore. Um, and that's kind of what we're trying to do. And it's a similar thing to starting our own distribution company. Everyone told us that it's way too hard. You guys can't figure it out. Brewers can't just run a distribution company. There's guys who's done this for decades, multi-generation businesses that are billion dollar revenues. Just give it to them. They'll get it there. And it was like, no, we're going to try to do it ourselves and we're going to do it better than you. Uh, right. We don't always do it better, but we try. <laughs> uh, thanks for all the good beer of the years. Um, can you talk about your uh, improvement process after you release a beer? Uh, I swear that uh, Whirlpool's gotten a little more bitter over the years. So I'm curious, like, once you release a beer, do you actually go back and look at it and like try and improve the recipe, or do you try and keep it as consistent as possible? I would say there's always a little bit of evolution in in the beers as as they as they as time goes by, as the brewers tweak them. Uh, and try to get them better and better. 
Uh, obviously, taste is subjective, and not all the times it is better. Uh, the other component I'll add is that it is an agricultural product at the end of the day. Mosaic hops from year to year do not always taste the same, um, which is a challenge, and we and that some of the tweaking is derived from that uh, around crop variability. Uh, but we do have a, 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 a tasting program where different versions of Whirlpool are tasted uh, against benchmark batches versus how they're aging on shelves, and if, if product is skewing out of what everyone deems as Whirlpool, then, then we, we reevaluate what went wrong or what changed and, and things like that. Um, but it, it's definitely hard to keep it as consistent. I mean, for all the sh shitting on Bud Light I've done, uh, they do an amazing job of getting that right. Uh, and that's something that we can't quite compete with, but we try our best. And we do have QA, QC processes in, uh, in line to try to mitigate any, any drift. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.